In this video, we're talking sample proportions and specifically how the central limit theorem allows us to talk about the distribution of relative frequencies. The whole goal of this section is really to prepare you when we talk about confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. These two things are inference-based statistics. They take sample information and they inference it onto a bigger group, onto a population. In order to make those inferences, we need to understand the makeup or how these samples are distributed so then we can use that information to predict how those populations will behave. And so if you remember before, we talked about these sample means and how they were distributed. They were a random variable. And so we were interested in their distribution. We said, look, they're normally distributed if by the central limit theorem, we had n was greater than or equal to 30, or if the question straight up told us that the data was normally distributed and it had its own mean, it's had its own standard deviation. And so we can compute those and talk about various probabilities. In this section, we're interested in a different type of sampling. We're interested in a sample proportion or p hat over here. And you can think of p hat like a relative frequency, something like, hey, look, 30% of people are doing what we're interested in. Or maybe you could write that as 0.3. It's like relative frequency. Here's why we need it. Oftentimes we're interested in studying qualitative variables. A uh, fun one might be something like hair color, where I can't take all those different responses and so I'll average them up. So the sample mean does not make sense in these qualitative variable situations. So we need this proportion instead. A classic example is a lot of polling questions are simply yes or no. Hey, look, how do you feel about X, Y, or Z? And you rate either on a scale or maybe just a simple yes, no reply. And so to that end, we're interested in a population proportion, often abbreviated just P, is what we're interested in describing that random variable. And so to this end, we have population proportion P, we have sample proportion P hat. This relationship is actually very similar population proportion close to sample proportion is similar in kind to the mean. Population mean is close to the sample mean. And so we'll see a little bit of the same conversation play out before that we're doing this approximation normal distributions. And so let's see how these things marry together and how we can talk about the sample proportion being a good point estimate for the population proportion. Let me slide down over here. Oop, there we go. As soon as you want to determine a population proportion, maybe say what people are going to vote on some upcoming bill, Prop A, B, C. Let's say it's known that seven out of every 10 citizens are going to vote in favor for this proposal. That's seven divided by 10, or it looks like a 70% approval. Well, I can go out and test that information. Again, this is not from every single individual, but you can imagine if I did, I could get some population information. Now it would tell me definitively it's going to win or not to win. Very difficult to get, however. So oftentimes, our best guess is from a sample. And ideally, these two should be pretty close. But every time we take a different sample, say maybe I talk to n equals 100 individuals, well, I'm gonna get a particular sample proportion from those individuals. If I take another different sample, talk to a different 100 people, n equals 100, I'll get a different sample proportion. This sample proportion is a random variable. To illustrate the point, I have my little example here. Say maybe I take 50 citizens and I find that 32 of them vote to pass the bill. They're a quote unquote, yes, that's what we're interested in. So then my sample proportion is 32 divided by 50, which is 0.64, which, hey, look, that is pretty close to my 0.7 for my population proportion. And that's ideally they should be relatively close. And so we're interested, yes, we can talk about closeness, maybe what we expect to happen, but we're interested in how this distribution is classified. Is it normal, uniform, binomial, probability distribution? Those are the ones that we're familiar with, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's geometric, maybe it's exponential. Well, we can look into it. So we're throwing around two terms here and that's population proportion and sample proportion. We do have some characters to represent these and it's just P for population proportion where I have X, the number of people doing what we're interested in, versus N, my sample size, or in the top case, my population size. For sample proportion, uh, the only difference is I have a little hat, I have P hat. And this is, again, very similar to the sample mean, X bar. 
let's get a practice. I want us to get a feel for what we mean by this p hat being completely a random variable. Consider a population of 20 people's response to receiving political pin magnetized to the shirt. You know, some people you walk up, you're like, hey, you want a pin? They're like, dude, free stuff. Uh, count me in. Yes. Other people you walk over and you say, hey, you want this free pin? They're like, yo, get away from me. No, thank you. So say maybe I'm going to take two samples of four people to estimate how the overall group feels who replied yes. Um, well, for my little sample over here, I got a yes, I got a no, and I got a yes and a yes. That means three out of the four people said yes as a proportion. That's 0.75 or 75% is how you can think about that. Say maybe I close my eyes and I go again and I pick four different people and, you know, I'm staying right over here. Maybe I talk to these four individuals. Oof, what a weird group. I get no for the first, no for the second, no for the third, and yes for the fourth. That's going to be one out of the four people who answered yes to my do you want a pin magnetized. That's 0.27. Notice if I took another sample, I would get maybe a different proportion. That these sample proportions, this 0.75, this 0.25, is actually something we can graph and we can look at the distribution of p hat. And these numbers should be close to p. That's the population proportion. For this example, that's x divided by capital N. Well, if I wanted to, I could count up all these buddies she did it before and there are 10 individuals doing what we want them to do, saying yes to collecting our pins out of the total 20 individuals. And so my actual true population proportion, well, hey, look at that. It is, in fact, directly in the middle here between my one extreme of getting three yeses and one nose. That was our first sample. And certainly much greater than our second one of 0.25. And that's the idea, right? That this sample proportion is going to fluctuate. It's going to have some movement. And it's going to be relatively close to the population mean. And so then can I quantify this random variable? Can I talk about what distribution that movement follows? Yes. The short answer is yes. Right. And the check goes something like this. The check actually relates a lot to the central limit theorem where n has to be greater than or equal to 30. I have to have a large enough sample size, but it's a bit more bold because I have two ingredients. Not only do I have n my sample size, but I have p proportion people doing what we want them to do. You can imagine if I had, let's say, uh, let's go for 100 people, but my proportion, the likelihood that a certain event or, or a response is going to happen was 0. 0.0001. Okay, probably not too many people responding to that. Well, if I multiply these two numbers together, I could get an expected number of people that are going to have this certain characteristic or this trait. Um, that's going to be, if I multiply 100 times 0. 0.0001, that's going to be 0. 0.01. That's uh, no one. No one's going to have that characteristic. And so that's why it's important that when I multiply these two numbers together, I should get at least, greater than or equal to, at least 10 people or objects that have the characteristic I'm interested in. On the flip side of that, if I have n times 1 minus p, I should have 10 people who basically say no or they do not have the characteristic I'm interested in. So we want to make sure that our group at least has some people. The limit there, there's actually two things to check. The first one is n times p. It's the number of people we expect to have the given trait we're interested in. And I also need to check n times 1 minus p. That's the number of people who are not interested in what we're selling. If these two things are true, then by the central limit theorem, just like for sample means, these sample proportions be at, they're normally distributed. Thank goodness, because that gives us a lot of power to talk about probability, percentiles, and a bunch of other calculations. Speaking of that normal distribution, let's get those two ingredients, the mean and the standard deviation. The mean of the sample proportions, otherwise written as mu sub p hat, is equal to this E, whenever you see it, think expected. What do I expect the sample proportion to be close to? Ah, the population proportion, just like we saw previously. For the spread, this form is a bit more involved. How wild is the sample proportion? It's going to be the square root of p, 1 minus p, divided by the square root. How wild is this sample proportion? It's going to be the square root of p times 1 minus p, divided by n. Make sure you multiply, divide, and then after that, take the square root. I'll warn you now because I don't want you to make a mistake. Whenever we're working with standard deviation or working with these, I'd encourage you to work 
with at least five to six decimals and answer in four decimals. All right, more the merrier for sure, but just make sure whenever you're simplifying or you're working with this that you have more decimals, that way you don't make a silly rounding error and then get an answer wrong for no reason. These mean and standard deviations are written here for our convenience. There's our mean, there's our standard deviation. You'll have those for quizzes and exams, for instance. If I look over on nut formula sheet, I wanna show you how that normal distribution is gonna change. Again, the value we're switching on K, still the same. For the population mean, that's the mean of the portions, that's just the population proportion, whatever the population is behaving. When I look at the standard deviation of the sample proportions, I have the formula here, square root. And so this is how it's gonna change computing probability with the sample proportions. Let's see an example of these sample proportions. A poll conducted in 2021 found that 69% of American Twitter users get at least some news on Twitter. A normal distribution may be used for the model of the sample proportion. A sample of 200 American Twitter users are polled in the sample proportion p hat of users to get at least some news on Twitter is calculated. This roughly 69% is actually pulled from pewresearch.org from a sample of roughly 2,500 Americans. Our first question, is p hat approximately normally distributed? In order to answer that question, that's where you get to the central limit theorem. You could also say, hey, look, very friendly, they mentioned it in the question above, but we should do our due diligence and check those two conditions. N times P has to be greater than or equal to 10, and N times one minus P has to be greater than or equal to 10. It's a question we're not sure we need to check. And for so here, they tell us how big the sample is. It looks like 200 individuals that we talked to. For the P, that's the proportion, is 0 0.69. If we multiply those two together, we'll get a very nice number of 138. And again, it's a question, we're not sure. Is it greater than or equal to 10? Hey, you betcha it is. It certainly satisfies the first. For the second one, I still have N times one minus P. N was 200. One minus P is one minus 0.69. If I wanna simplify this, I can write 200 times one minus 0.69 is 0.31. That's going to equal, if you multiply those two together, 62, which again, the quantity, make sure that it's greater than or equal to 10. And for both of these cases, look, we're good. They're satisfied. And so, yes, P hat is normally distributed. Yes. Which is good because now we can talk about probability. If it wasn't normally distributed, we might have to find a workaround. You'll see an example like that in a minute. What we want to do now is I want to find the mean in the standard deviation of the sample proportion. Again, normal is great for computing probability, but I need these two ingredients, and that's what this question helps us introduce. Of the sample proportions, one of the most friendly formulas that we have is just equal to the population proportion. Up top, that's 0.69. Very friendly formula. For the standard deviation of the sample proportions is the square root of P, 1 minus P, divided by N. For square root, I can write it over here. Square root, whoop. P is 0.69, and then I have 1 minus 0.69, all divided by N, which is 200. So certainly you can type that in your calculator. I want to demonstrate for you what you would write if you wanted to calculate that in Excel. That's what this blank here is for. Again, you don't have to, but I think it's beneficial to get the practice in. In order to do the square root, there's actually a very sophisticated Excel function. It's called squirt. If you start typing in Excel, will go, oh, I know what you're talking about. What do I want to take the square root of? 0.69, little star here, 1 minus 0.69 in my parentheses. I then want to divide all of this. I'll just divide by 200. If you close the brackets, you'll get a standard deviation of 0 0.0327. The mean of my sample proportions is 0.69. Nice. For the standard deviation, it should be 0 0.0327. And we get both of our measures there. So really this first part, these A, Bs serve as a starting block to say, look, we know what distribution we're using. We also know what the mean and standard deviation are. We're off to the races. We can do probability. Yes, we do percentiles. And that's exactly what we'll do in the next part. So similar game as before. Here's my mean and here's my standard deviation. I want to find probability that the sample proportion P at is greater than 67%. 
percent. We're going to know what the average is, what I can expect to happen. But what's the probability that when I look at those 200 individuals and I talk to all of them, that more than 67% of them get some news on Twitter? Well, anytime you hear probability, I encourage you to write it out. It's saying the probability that P hat, that the sample proportion, I'm not talking about one individual, I'm not talking about a sample mean, is greater than 67%. Let me write that as 0.67. We were so close. I know this is normal distribution. That's a very friendly thing to know because that also tells you your limitations or what powers your function has. All these distributions have to, have to, have to be less than. Well, fortunately for us, anytime you see greater, there's a way you can convert that. And it's just one minus less than. And now we can flip the script. And so I can write this as one minus the probability that P hat is less than 0.67. And now we're in an appropriate form to calculate probability. I would type it. I'll write it. You can type it like this. One minus normal or norm dot distribution. And then I have my four inputs. The first one was K 0.67, the value that we're switching on. The next value is the mean. We calculated that previously. That was the 0.69 standard deviation, 0 0.0327. And then the last value, always the same, is going to be one. Let me write that probability over here. That should be 0.7296. Or maybe for clarity's sake, I can think of, look, there's a 73% chance that the portion will be greater than 67%. And so I think what makes it tricky is there's a lot of proportions, frequencies, percentages thrown around. It's important to understand the difference between probability, like my 73%, versus I encourage you to think of this as a relative frequency. How many people are using Twitter out of my sample of 200? 67% or more. And it's fairly likely that that'll be the case. But we're not restricted to only asking questions in relative frequency form, like 67%. I can ask them in a frequency form. Let me give you an example. Is it likely that less than 120 users of the 200 sampled get at least some news from Twitter? Is it likely? Okay, hint, hint, they're asking for probability. Anytime they say, hey, look, is it unusual? Is it unlikely? That's something we can actually quantify and calculate. It's all right here, probability of. But notice it doesn't say sample proportion. In fact, it just says, is it likely that less than 120 users? So this is more like X, one person is less than 120. This isn't quite the same as talking about a proportion. It's just talking about the number of people that we look at in the group. Well, we're in a pickle because how X, how this one person or one person's, in this case, 120 of them, are distributed. We don't have that distribution label. And so I need to get this in terms of a sample proportion. We have a very friendly way to do that. Let me keep most of this skeleton true less than. I have probability. There's actually a very fancy formula that I can use to convert this to a sample proportion. This 120 is a frequency. If I have a frequency and I have the sum or the total, I can find the relative frequency that's simply going to be 120 divided by my sample size, 200. Ah, and there we go. Now we have a proper proportion. And so that's really the trick to unlocking this question here. So now that I have the appropriate form, I can calculate my probability here. It should be equals norm dot distribution, norm dot dist. My inputs are, you can literally write 120 divided by 200 in the cell, or if you wanted to, you could divide that and get 60 divided by 100, or better known as 60%. That's the proportion we're interested in. For the mean and the standard deviation, this is not gonna change for us, thank goodness. It should be 0.69 for the mean, 0 0.0327 for the standard deviation. And of course, that last input is always gonna be a one for the normal distribution. And me oh my, they're asking, is it likely, do you think it's gonna happen 120 or less users are gonna get their news from Twitter? Uh, no, I'm thinking that's not likely. In fact, I would probably flip it and instead say the opposite. I would say it's likely, very likely, that more than 
120 out of the 200 people are getting their news from Twitter. In fact, the probability that it's more than 120 is the complement of our probability we have down here. So it's going to be 0.997. I mean, goodness sakes, that's pretty darn close to guaranteed. So we can answer questions about sample proportions, whether it's asked as a relative frequency, like 67%, or if it's asked as a value, a number of people, we can work that into a frequency. There's also some broader questions we can answer, and this is where we start to get us some mixing of distributions. Let's say out of those 200 sampled, how many would you expect to get at least some of their news from Twitter? To get some of their news from Twitter. Anytime you hear expect, you should be thinking the mean. That's why I have our little hint here. But notice if I use the mean that we talked about up top, the green mean, it was 0.69. That doesn't quite give me the value I'm interested. That's not a number of people that I expect to use. This actually leans into a really interesting question that we say, maybe normal distribution isn't the right distribution to answer this type of question. Because in fact, the way this question is phrased, it's more like I'm looking at each user. I'm saying, look, do you get your news from Twitter? All right, moving on to the next one. Hey, do you get your news from Twitter? Okay, moving on to the next one. I look at the next one. And I'm looking at 200 users independently, and I'm answering that same question. And in fact, I have a probability of success, that's 69% in number of trials. I have P, probability of success. I know what distribution this is going to wind up being. N200, P is 0.69. This looks like binomial distribution. The reason that's friendly is yes, I can do probability with binomial distribution. In fact, we'll talk about it in a minute. But more appropriately, I can talk about the expected value because the expected value is the mean. And for binomial distribution, that's simply, that's n times p. That's 200 for n times p is 0.69. If you multiply those two numbers together, you should get 138 people. And so again, that's the power of distributions is that I don't need to go through some fancy argument to figure out how I can figure out the average. Once I know what distribution it follows, it's not trivial, but certainly it's much more straightforward. I'm not pulling values out of a hat. They come from that distribution. Speaking of that distribution of binomial, you might be asking yourself, well, hey, look, if I can do the mean this way, why can't I do probability this way? It's actually a great question to ask. If I zoom in over here, notice the probability that we did earlier with the 120. That's actually a perfect example of something you could do binomial distribution with. That look, I'm interested in getting 119 or fewer successes out of N, my number of trials, P, my probability of success, and the last input is a one. And notice, look how close these probabilities are. We said it was approximately normal. This is how approximately normal they are. Very, very close, 0.0028 right to 0.0030. In fact, the air there, oof, is so small, it's 8% air. And so when we say approximate, it's not exact. The same is true for the part C probability that you could do binomial distribution with that one. You'd end up with 70% probability compared to 73. But on a percent error, very small relative error of 3%. And so, yes, when you're reading these examples, sometimes binomial distribution does speak to you. And so that's where there's always a hint to say, hey, look, we're using normal distribution to approximate. And the main reason we need normal distribution as opposed to binomial is because binomial distribution is not useful for inferencing from. You can't take binomial distribution and inference onto it a bigger group. Instead, normal distribution is what we use for those inference-based statistics. And so that's why we need normal distribution to these sample proportions as well. Let me show you one more picture here. We mentioned earlier we need a large enough sample size that n times p has to be greater than or equal to 10. Well, this is primarily why we have a nice p value. In fact, when you look at the graph of my data, it has a nice curve to it. It's bell shaped. Yeah, this data is very much approximately normal. Next example. Before determining a particular university's in class cell phone policy, all the way back in 2017, they commissioned a group to determine the percentage of students who want to use their cell phones in class. Surprisingly, about 100%. A pollster finds that 94% of college students want to use their phones in class. Times have changed, however, and you suspect that in-class cell phone use has dropped in recent years that people are less uh, addicted. It's more seen as a bad habit. So you're going to take a sample of 36 college students and calculate the sample proportion PI of those who 
want to use their phones in class. This 94% actually came from a website. It's campustechnology.com. And you might be asking yourself, why do websites gather data like this? Some of it's grants, various grants that are conducted. So some of this is like student-led that students gather. Other of it's data like for digital tech places that are trying to sell technology to teachers. They're like, hey, look, educator, students are on their cell phones in class. Maybe we can offer our technology that'll help keep them on task on their cell phones in your class. So naturally we're asking the question, I'm gonna talk about the distribution of the sample proportion out of these 36 students. Is it normally distributed? Again, that normal distribution, you should always be checking your sample size for proportion. It's n times p has to be greater than or equal to 10 and n times one minus p has to be greater than or equal to 10. For n times p, my group, I only talked to 36 people. Okay, I was a bit shy, I didn't wanna bother anybody. So I just talked to 36. For my proportion, my P, that should be 0.94. I can multiply those two numbers together and I should get a nice number like 33.84. Good check, that is greater than or equal to 10. Whew, we're golden. For the next check, I have N, that's 36 times one minus 0.94. I can clean this up a little bit. That's gonna be 36 times 0.06 or 6%. Uh oh, if I multiply those two together, I'll get 2.16. Uh, you can run a little frowny face there. We're not happy about that because I needed to be greater than or equal to 10, but this is a fail here. It's not. And so when we ask the question, is it normally distributed? And so all we can say is that there's not enough evidence to say normal. Bummer. And so no. And then so if we're trying to answer questions about probability, for instance, circle which distribution you should use to find the probability that 30 or fewer of college students want to use their cell phones in class. Hint, we're thinking what distribution are we talking about here? Well, we can't do normal because again, we don't satisfy that central limit theorem check or sample isn't large enough. Hmm. Well, then we need to think about what distribution, this is what my hint is, has n and p. Well, I have n, number of students I'm dealing with here, in this case, 36. And I have my P, my probability of success. I'm looking at each student saying, hey, look, do you use your cell phone in class? So get the next one and so on. I have that 0.94. Once you have these two ingredients, you're off to the races. The distribution that this probability is gonna follow is binomial again, because we have the N and the P and also the independence as we look at each student. So let's see if we can do some binomial distribution. Find the probability that 30 or fewer of the college students want to use their phones in class. So I can write it just like we read it. They're saying something about probability. I can write that probability that I'm not looking at sample proportions, I'm not looking at sample means. This is just a regular old friendly X is 30 or fewer. So at less than or equals to 30. It's been a minute since we've done binomial distribution since you've seen an example. So let me write it like this. We actually had two different formulas for binomial distribution. One was if you had equal to a certain value like K and it was binom dot distribution. We had K, N, and P no. and that last input was a zero. If you had less than or equal to, well, it was a very similar story. Okay, make sure that equal to is highlighted. X is less than or equal to K. Then you had binom dot distribution, K, N, P, and here's the one difference. It's a one. And so this is the only two ways that I can compute probability with the binomial distribution. Very fancy for us, we already have it. Let's get into writing it out. Like right here equals binom dot distribution. Again, because that's the distribution of my X character, my random variable. K, the value we're interested in is 30. And then you know N and P. Again, N is just the sample size that we've had in the past. That's 36. P, my probability of success, in this case, it's that they want to use their cell phones in class. Not sure why we define that to be success, but that's how we're doing here. And then my last input should be a one. And if I type that information incorrectly, we should real quickly get a probability, it looks like, of 0 0.0192. Or if I want to round up, that's a 2% chance that 30 or fewer of them will want to use their cell phone. 
There's two things I want to talk about. The first is compare this if I used the normal distribution. Say maybe we ignored our advice and we said, let's use the normal distribution and see what happens. We would be way, way off. Not even close. Don't count on it. Look at this probability. 0 0.0035 compared to 0 0.0192. This is not even a percentage. It's 0.3%. Right? Not even on the board compared to our 2%. That's an 82% relative error. These things are not even related. And they're not related. If I highlight the graph, we can see it here. That this distribution is not normal. It's not bell-shaped. We talked about the binomial distribution, how it was kind of bell-shaped, but it always had a tail, either going in the left or the right, depending on if your p-value was large, like it is here, 94%, or if it's small, that's going to move and skew that graph in either direction. So that's the first thing I want to talk about is probability. It's different. Make sure we're using the correct distribution. The second foreshadowing that I want to make here is that you might be asking yourself, what is this probability useful for? What does it do? Well, say maybe you're actually in practice and you're finding this in your situation that you have 30 or fewer students who want to use their cell phone. Well, there's a couple things you could come to. Either you could say, well, hey, we are very lucky that we have this because it's very unlikely that this happened serendipitously or likely that this 94% is bunk. Again, it's old news. This is from 2017. Maybe the times have changed and that number is outdated. This idea of pushing against what is stated fact is really all about hypothesis testing. That's one of the whole points of getting into hypothesis testing is we look at measures and we say, look, I, I think that's changed in some way. And then we can use probability to quantify the likelihood that these two things are true, that the population information is true and that we got the sample information that we got. And certainly in this case, oof, I'm thinking unlikely. And that's the application for hypothesis testing. So I wanted to foreshadow that for you in this example. Next example. Suppose that a market research firm is hired to estimate the percentage of children aged 11 and below own a smartphone in America. In 2019, they find that 53% of children own a smartphone by age 11. You doubt the firm's findings and suspect that Far fewer children own a smartphone. You're like, dude, that is 53%. You randomly select 500 children, age 11 and below, and calculate the sample proportion of those who own a smartphone. This information comes from a couple different places. It was the NPR.org had some, the Common Sense Census had some information. That was the 2009 where that came from. So this is kind of roughly uh, correct. So this number is roughly correct from those two different sources. An intern's going to do some work for us on this one. An intern computes some calculations, a mean, a standard deviation, and also a central limit theorem check for us. Let's see if we can use them. First question, is that sample proportion, proportion the proportion of 11-year-olds who own a smartphone, is it approximately normal? Again, this should always get, bring you back to the check. N times P greater than or equal to 10, maybe, and n times 1 minus p has to be greater than or equal to 10. Always a check, we're not sure. Well, again, luckily for us, that intern computed the work for us. n times p is 265, big old check mark, that one's perfect. n times 1 minus p is 235. Also, big check, good to go here. So yes, this p hat is normally distributed which again should be a sigh of relief for us because now we're not dealing with wild, wild west. Now we're living in a box. We know the function that this situation follows. So now we can answer questions like probability. The two sample proportions, which constitute the middle 95% of sample proportions are 0.486 all the way to 0.574. Let me draw a picture real quick so we can understand what's going on here. I have the normal distribution, nice bell-shaped curve, Woo. Okay, fairly nice. And I have my two proportions here. P1 hat and P2 hat. And I can draw a line in the sand here, line in the sand here. And it looks like these are perfectly split up in the middle to contain 95% of my data. These two proportions are 48%. If I round down, 48%. 
all the way to 57%. If I, again, round down. And these are like lines in the sand. And so if I wanted to get a good idea, these are going to cover most sample proportions. And so ideally, and this is what the conversation behind confidence intervals is all about, it says we can actually quantify, this is a little bit more work involved, but bear with me, we can quantify the likelihood that the population proportion is somewhere inside of there. Because if I kept taking sample proportions, just like we saw in the past, that the sample proportions should be a pretty close estimation for the population proportion. So if I can get a wide range, 95% of those sample proportions, then maybe I can argue that the population proportion is in this range from 48% to 57%. And this projection is what confidence level is all about. Again, there's more components than that, being a bit hand wavy, but I want us to appreciate that these sampling distributions, what they give rise to confidence intervals. But that's not the question that's being asked here. Instead, we're being asked, would it be unusual to discover that 243 or fewer of the 500 sampled children on a smartphone, would that be strange to find? There's actually a goofy calculation that you'll find the probability here is quite friendly. Let me show you. So we're asking for probability. Anytime we're asked unusual, it's something we can quantify. But they're not asking me for a sample proportion, at least not just yet. They're saying, look, what's the probability that X, a random variable, is 243 or fewer? So that's less than or equal to 243. Well, notice up top, I don't know how X is distributed. I know how P hat is. So let me transform this into a question about a sample proportion P hat. Again, 243 is a frequency. So let me take 243 and divide it by 500 by sample size. And then I can write this as the probability that the sample proportion P hat is less than or equal to, if you divide 243 divided by 500, you'll get 0.486. And so the probability that we're trying to find is actually this probability on the left side of that first proportion, sample proportion, probability of many over there. Some of you might be able to figure out if we have the middle 95%, but we can certainly do it in Excel over here. Let me fill it in for us. I should write equals. I know that sample proportion is normally distributed. So I'll write norm.distribution. The K value I'm switching on is 0.486. I then have the mean and the standard deviation that lucky for us, the intern calculated for us. That was 0.53 for the average. For the standard deviation, 0.0223. That last input for an old distribution is always going to be a one. If we calculate this probability, we'll get 0 0.0242. Or if we want to think about that as a percentage, I can think about that as 2.4%. Let me go back to my chart over here. This is the middle 95%. And so if I was asking how much probability is on either side, it would not be 5%, it would be half of 5%. It would be 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side. And so that's all this example highlights for us is that we have these important milestones or markers that we can pick up and that can lead to confidence intervals in the future. And oftentimes these confidence intervals, these probabilities, they go hand in hand. In fact, this is where we get the confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Confidence intervals comes from this notion of inferencing, taking sample information, saying, hey, look, this is where we're pretty sure the population information is inside of. And then we project that we say, hey, look, I don't know exactly what the population information is. Again, it's up here. It says 53, which, hey, is inside of there. And so let me wrap it in this way that when we talk about these sampling distributions, it's a means to an end to help us to understand that we can take sample information, like an anecdotal, it's maybe a random sampling and then somehow take that information and inference it onto a larger group. Well, how do we do that? If we understand the spread or how that distribution is played out, well, then I can answer questions like what we have written up here, that if I know that 95% of my sample proportions are inside of this range, well, then I can be pretty sure, again, there's more math that we're breezing over, we'll talk about it at a later date, that my population proportion is inside of this range because if I keep getting sample proportions, they should be inside. Again, it's not guaranteed, right? There's still some probability that it might be outside of there. 
but I'm pretty sure that the population proportion is inside of there. That's really what confidence intervals is all about. Hypothesis testing, on the other hand, is all about the probability this unlikely that these two things occur. And it's these sampling distributions that builds the foundation for us to make these big inference-based statistics, these big predictions that we take information that's anecdotal, like sample information, and then to make inferences upon that. Now, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with inference-based statistics, but it's important that we understand not only the foundation, so we talked about here, but also how to compute those values. Look, if you enjoyed the video, I appreciate the time you put into it. If you didn't, I apologize. For the rest of us, see you in the next one.